Well, it's it's like it's hard to get an attorney here because if you look at the corruption here, uh, the last few attorneys that people's had here have been charged with corruption. Uh, and all this is documented. Just uh, pull up corruption attorneys in Glynn County. It'll state several other names. Uh, pull up corruption, Glynn County, Brunswick, Georgia, Supreme Court judge, you know, corruption, Glynn County, uh, uh, county commissioners, corruption, Glynn County, Brunswick, Georgia, Glynn County Police Department, corruption, Brunswick, Georgia. Look, pull it up and see for yourself what's happened in the past three years. So how was any man going to receive, uh, 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 let's just say, legal justice for his actions when the justice the judicial system and the justice system itself is failing welcome to the aboriginal channel on this episode we're going to be looking at brunswick georgia from the aboriginal's perspective so right here we're looking at where it's basically on the east coast and it has all these creeks and all these different rivers so from here we're going to go over to wikipedia where i love to be at so right here in the history section is it says the Makama or the Timakua speaking people originally occupied the lands in what is now Brunswick. Goes on to say that the Spanish established missions in the Timakua's villages beginning in 1568. During this time, much of the Native American population was depleted through enslavement and disease. It says three years after the province of Georgia was founded in 1733, James Oglethorpe had the town of Florica built on St. Simon's Island, which is this little island right here. It says St. Simon's Island right here. And this is the fort that they said he had built on that island. As you can see, it's very rudimentary. It was built by Indians. It has the battlements at the top where you see those little end caves. If you go in this book right here from 1671 called America being the latest and most accurate description of the new world, it has a depiction in it right here. And it shows a stone structure with those battlements or those enclaves on top of this stone structure right here. The book was published in 1671 and James Oglebrook supposedly had Frederica built in 1733 but let's see who James Oglethorpe is says was a British soldier member of parliament and philanthropist as well as the founder of the colony of Georgia as a social reformer he hoped to resettle Britain's worthy poor in the new world initially focusing on those in debtors prisons says that in 1728, three years before conceiving the Georgia colony, Oglethorpe chaired a parliamentary committee on prison reform. The committee documented horrendous abuses in three debtors prisons. As a result of the committee's actions, many debtors were released from prison with no means of support. Oglethorpe viewed this as part of the larger problem of urbanization which was depleting the countryside of productive people and depositing them in cities, particularly London, where they often became impoverished or resorted to criminal activity. Pause. So this guy right here, James Edward Overthrow, the so-called father of Georgia, brought over a bunch of criminals. And earlier it said before this man got to Georgia that the Native American population was depleted. However, it says right here that Oglethorpe and the first colonists arrived at South Carolina on the ship Anne in late 1732 and settled near the present site of Savannah, Georgia. He negotiated with the Yamacraw tribe for land. Oglethorpe became great friends with Chief Tamachichi, who was the chief of the Creek Indian village of Yamacraw, and built a series of defensive forts, most notably Fort Frederica of which substantial remains can still be visited. But let's go back up here for a second. It says, Oglethorpe and the trustees. Now, trustees, you know what those are, like a prison trustee, a jail trustee. Oglethorpe and the trustees formulated a contractual, multi-tiered plan for the settlement of Georgia. The plan envisioned a system of agrarian equality designed to support and perpetuate an economy based on family farming and prevent social disintegration associated with unregulated urbanization. Land ownership was limited to 50 acres, a grant that included a town lot, a garden plot near town, and a 45-acre farm. Self-supporting colonists were able to obtain larger grants, but such grants were structured in 50-acre increments tied to the number of indentured servants supported by the grantee. Servants would receive a land grant 
of their own upon completing their term of service. No one was permitted to acquire additional land through purchase or inheritance. So these were the indigent servants that came over, which were Europeans. So here we got James Oglethorpe, the trustees who are basically indigent servants, and we have the Creek Indians. Down here it says that in 1734, Oglethorpe visited Britain aboard HMS Alderborough, taking with him a delegation of Creek Indians who met with George II and his family at Kingsington Palace. So there's another case where Indians went over to Europe undoubtedly to go and build things because the Indians were great builders. So I got to point out right here that even though right here it says Oglethorpe and his fellow trustees were granted a royal charter for the province of Georgia between Savannah and Altamata rivers in 1732, says up here that in 1733 he negotiated with the Yamakra tribe for land and became friends with the chief Tomochichi, who was the chief of the Indian village of Yamakra. But let's go back over here to Brunswick real quick. So just like they claimed that Fort Frederica was built by the European guy right here, it says the area's first European settler, Mark Carr, arrived in 1738. Carr, a Scotsman, was a captain in Oglethorpe's Marine Boat Company. Upon landing, he established his thousand acre tobacco plantation, which he called Plug Point, along the East and Brunswick rivers. The province of Georgia purchased Carr's fields in 1771 and laid out the town of Brunswick in the grid plant akin to that of Savannah with large public squares at given intervals. Now, whenever it says that it was laid out with public squares, you have to question it, just like you question the fort, just like you question the actual position of the town with, with all those creeks, rivers, and up against the ocean like that. But here in this book from 1851, the history of Alabama and incidentally that of Georgia and Mississippi from the earliest period. It says that when DeSoto and Tuscaloosa arrived at the capital called Mobila, it stood by the side of a large river upon a beautiful plain and consisted of 80 handsome houses, each compacitous enough to contain a thousand men. They all fronted a large public square. So American Indians, American Aboriginals already had towns with grid plans with public squares. But going back over here to Brunswick, if we go look at the demographics, we see that it is 59% so-called African-American, so-called Black American. That was in 2010 census. There's no telling what it is now. It's probably 65%. Now we'll jump back over to James Oglethorpe. It says right here that on the 21st of February, 1734, Oglethorpe established the first Masonic Lodge within the British colony of Georgia. Says it is now known as Solomon's Lodge Number no. 1. It is the oldest continuously operating English constituted lodge of Freemasons in the Western Hemisphere. So another interesting part about Oglethorpe, it says owning to the colony's primary role as a military buffer between English and Spanish held territories. The original model for the colonization of Georgia excluded the use of slave labor, fearing that runaway slaves could internally weaken the colony and assist the enemy at St. Augustine, Florida. But instead of slaves defecting southwards to the Spanish, runaways from the Carolinas found refuge in Georgia, thus irritating its northern neighbor. The banning of slavery also reduced the workforce, and this was felt to be a constraint on Georgia's early economic growth. So they saying right there that so-called runaway slaves went to Georgia because they didn't have slavery there. But then after that, after it says that runaway slaves ran to Georgia because Georgia didn't have a slavery system there and how because of it, the economy at the colony was lagging. It says that in 1743, after Oglethorpe had left the colony, the ban on slavery was lifted. Various forces united, including the English, who always urged it. As a result, large numbers of slaves were soon imported. So it made the mistake right there of saying that slaves had already ran to Georgia. See, it says runaways from the Carolinas found refuge in Georgia. But all of that is a false narrative to say that there were a bunch of Indians already there. Says this guy Overthrow 
built a home outside of the walls of Fort Federica that is marked by a small historical marker. So the Indians who lived inside of the fort, presumably, allowed the European to have a home or built the man a home outside of the fort. But we're going to jump over into his Masonic Lodge creation and how that plays a role in this as well because right here it says that Oglethorpe's secretary was Charles Wesley later well known as a hymn writer of Methodism so the Methodism whenever you hear that that's assimilation so it would sound right as Oglethorpe's secretary was Charles Wesley later well known as a hymn writer of assimilation I will circle back around and connect Freemasonry with Indian assimilation either at the end of this video or I'll make a whole nother video. But right now I'm gonna focus on somewhat the history of Freemasonry. So here we have a book called Demonology of King James I by King James I. It says Demonology of King James I was written and published in 1597 by King James VI of Scotland, later King James I of England as a philosophical dissertation on contemporary necromancy and the historical relationships between the various methods of divination used from ancient black magic. Now, what is necromancy? Necromancy is conjuration of the spirits of the dead for purposes of magically revealing the future or influencing the course of events. The novel centers on the practice of necromancy and its influence on the world of the living. But in the book description on Amazon, it goes on to say that this included a study on demonology and the methods demons used to bother troubled men. It also touches on topics such as werewolves and vampires. It was a political yet theological statement to educate a misinformed populace on the history practices and implications of sorcery and the reasons for persecuting a person in a Christian society accused of being a witch under the rule of canonical law. This book is believed to be one of the main sources used by William Shakespeare in the production of Macbeth. Shakespeare attributed many quotes and rituals found within the book directly to the Weird Sisters, yet also attributed the Scottish themes and settings referenced from the trials in which King James was involved. So before they had the witch trials in Massachusetts, they had trials in Europe where they were massacring people based upon their beliefs. But this man right here, King James I, wrote a book and basically outlined everything about the methods demons use to bother troubled men and how the book was political yet theological statement to educate and misinform populace on the history practices and implications of sorcery and the reasons for persecuting a person in a Christian society. So the basically the book was a standard for seeking out witches and persecuting them. Now on a side note to make a connection in a previous video where I connect the ancient religions of Egypt, the island of Atlantis and the Western Hemisphere. And within that video, I explained how are we read where their religion involved rituals, black magic and witchery. And inside the definition for necromancy, it is synonymous with bewitchery, bewitchment, conjuring, devilry, diablery, enchantment, enscrollment, magic, mojo, sorcery, the matriarchy, voodooism, witchcraft, witchery, wizardry. But let's get back over here. So in 1597, King James I published a book that outlined the methods, demons, how they bothered troubled men and how to persecute those people. Then in 1598, a year later, at Crossword to Backdash King James Freemasons, says that Freemasonry in its present form came into being through the Lodge system established under the Aspius of King James VI of Scotland, later King James I of England, the only son of Roman Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. At the age of 37, two years after becoming a Mason, James became the first Stuart King of England and immediately began to persecute the Puritans, rejecting their petition to reform the Church of England along biblical lines. 
says that 15 years after taking active control of Scotland and five years before becoming English monarch, he ordered that the Masonic structure be given leadership and organization. He made a senior Mason named William Shaw his general warden of the craft and instructed Shaw to revamp the entire structure of Freemasonry into what it becomes today. Shaw commenced his project on the 28th of December, 1898, on the orders of James. So that was a year after 1597, he ordered the Masons to be revamped. And then about five years after that, he commissioned the King James Version, also known as the King James Bible, or simply the authorized version, is an English translation of the Christian Bible from the Church of England, was commissioned in 1604 and completed as well as published in 1611. And to give some a bit of correlation here, it says right here that the year 1590 witnessed the largest and most high profile witch trials in Scottish history. No fewer than 70 suspects were rounded up in North Berwick on suspicion of raising a storm to destroy King James's fleet as he conveyed his new bride. So it's saying that they were suspected of raising a storm to destroy King James's fleet. Okay, let that sink in for a little bit. But right here it says the Salem witch trials were a series of hearings and prosecutions of people accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1693, a hundred years later, basically, from the witch trials of King James in Europe. At a website called historyextra.com, period, Stuart, King James the Sixth, I Hunted Witches, Hunter, Devilry, Demonology, it says the witch hunts that swept across Europe from 1450 to 1750 were among the most controversial and terrible terrifying phenomenon in history, Holocaust of their times. Historians have long attempted to explain why and how they took such rapid enduring hold in communities as desperate and distant from one another as Navarre and Copenhagen. They resulted in the trial of around 100,000 people, most of them women, a little under half of whom were put to death. One of the most active centers of witch hunting was Scotland. Now remember, that's where King James was from, where perhaps 4,000 people were consigned to the flames, a striking number for such a small country, and more than double the execution rate in England. The ferocity of these persecutions can be attributed to the most notorious royal witch hunter, King James the Sixth of Scotland, who in 1603, a year before the Bible was commissioned, became King James the First of England. Now, one more piece to this puzzle I'll leave you with. It says right here that mesmerized by magic, known as the Cradle King, James had become the nominal ruler of Scotland at the age of just 13 months, following the enforced abdication of his mother, Mary, Queen of Scots, in 1567. She had subsequently fled to England, where she remained the captive of Elizabeth I for some 20 years until her execution in 1588. His mother's violent death seems to have inspired in James a dark fascination with magic. His Highness told me her death was visible in Scotland before it did really happen, related Sir John Harrington years later, being as he said, spoken of in secret by those whose power of sight presented to them a bloodied head dancing in the air. So we just learned that King James, the man responsible for writing his own version of the Bible, was a demonologist and also a notorious or the notorious witch hunter. But let's go back over here to Brunswick because there's some things we got to point out about this story. So it says that the area's first European settler, Mark Carr, arrived in 1738. A car, a Scotsman, was a captain in Oglethorpe's Marine Boat Company. Now, if Oglethorpe had a Marine Boat Company. Where were all the slaves at? Remember, they said there were boatloads of slaves coming from Europe this whole time. Meanwhile, the first European settler in 1738 was a captain in a Marine Boat Company, yet there's no mention of him bringing any slaves here. There is a mention that upon landing, he established his thousand acre tobacco plantation. Now, in a previous video, when I talked about Georgia, a third of the entire state, the counties there were made 
1850 or after, which is why we see that this place, Brunswick, was incorporated in 1856. 1856 is in the middle of the last Seminole War, which took place south of Brunswick, but in that area somewhat. And down here it says that by 1860, Brunswick had a population of 468 people, a bank, a weekly newspaper, and a sawmill, which employed nine workers. Then when you go down here and look at the actual historical population, in 1810, it had 36 people. And in 1860, right here, it said it had 825 people. Now, remember that the population currently is around 16,000 people at 60% black. Here at another page called the History of Brunswick, Georgia, it says the recorded history of Brunswick, Georgia dates to 1738 when a thousand acre plantation was established along the Turtle River. By 1789, the city was recognized by President George Washington as having been one of the five original ports of entry for the American colonies. In 1797, Brunswick's prominence was further recognized when it became the county seat of Glen County, a status it retains to this day. During the later stages of the Civil War, with the approach of the Union Army, much of the city was abandoned and burned. When it says it was abandoned and burned, you know it was full of Indians. And they would do that because they didn't want the Indians to come back once they left. They didn't want you to have any kind of valuable or any value towards where you were from, basically, because it was it had been burned down and reoccupied by Europeans. Now, this is what it says happened after the Civil War. It says, after suffering from post-war depression in the 1870s, in 1874, one of the nation's largest lumber mills began operation on St. Simon's Island, leading to the return of economic prosperity. So that lets you know that they, when they got in there, they start cutting down the trees. And in previous videos, I talked about where Indians had railroads first. But right here, it says canals and rivers gave way to rail traffic as the Brunswick and Albany and Macon and Brunswick railroads connected Georgia to the port of Brunswick. Something interesting right here on the history of Brunswick, Georgia page it says that in 1789, Georgia Washington proclaimed Brunswick one of the five original ports of entry for the colonies. Because of this notion, the city became prosper. And in 1797, the Georgia General Assembly in Louisville transferred the county seat of Glen County from Frederica on St. Simon's Island to Brunswick. Now, if it started to prosper in 1797, why is the population count or the census for 1800? Because they started in 1790. So they should have had a 1800 census count. But right here, it starts at 1810 with 36 people. And if a place is that prosperous, it had to have had more than 36 people. And then if you look right here, there's a 50 year gap in between 1810 in 1850 there's no census counts and that's because warriors in that area were at war from basically 1812 into the 1850s and 1860s basically because right here at the battles of the american civil war in georgia you will see that they had lots of indians fighting there still in the 1860s and to back that up when you go look at the list of native americans that were in the american civil war you have the Cherokee, the Creeks, and the Seminoles all in that war in the 1860s, which would have been in this area right here. Through the history books, which has all been a lie, so therefore, if it's a lie, then what's the truth? If it's a lie, then what's the truth?